Drifting on the Clinch River I love running water that trickles down a mountain or rushes between riverbanks. I live in East Tennessee where natural water lovers like me drown in its abundance. Two of my favorite water places are on either side of the Norris Dam, the first of those mighty TVA dams built in the Great Depression. The extensive Norris Lake is on one side and the tranquil Clinch River on the other. They seem as natural and forever as I can imagine. The dam interrupts the clinch in between where it begins as a trickle in the mountains of southwest Virginia and where it ends to join the Tennessee River below Kingston. The water of the clinch below the dam is clear and cold, quite unlike many other rivers in the valley that tend to run warm and turbid. That clinch, that clinch water comes from the clear cold bottom waters of Norris Lake. The water is as perfect for trout as it is heaven for me. TVA controls the level of the water in the lake by releasing it not as a steady flow, but in surges, depending on the rainfall that was or will be, and depending on the needs for electricity with some generous consideration for the desires of anglers or kayakers and canoeists like me. The dam houses hydroelectric generators, which are somewhat easy to start and stop, so they operate them when the demand for electricity is greater. When the generators are off, there is at least a slow flow of water to keep the water to keep the river moving. Anglers gather at this time to fish the quiet pools just below the dam. Kayakers and canoeists need deeper water to clear the occasional fault lines of, of rock that cross the path of the river. If one generator is running, there is enough water for at least one path through the faults. Two or more generators will feed enough water to clear all the faults for an effortless but faster and still safe trip, even for a novice. A TVA website announces the schedule for the generators a day out. On a nice day, if one is predicted for that, for that or the next day, I'll check the TVA schedule. If I haven't gone in a few days and the weather is good, I'll call a friend and say, The gins are running. Care for a canoe? My friend Susie loves canoeing as much as anyone I know, and perhaps even more than I, so she rarely says no and might even call me first to beg to go. My canoe is rigged upside down from my carport ceiling on chains and a pulley. I've got all of my gear in the corner of the garage. When all is go, I pack the cooler and dr with drinks and ice and put some chips and cookies in Ziplocs. I load all this in the back of my SUV and then lower the canoe onto the roof racks and strap her down all in 10 minutes. If I start in my pajamas, I can be ready in pulling out my driveway in 20. Our routine is for Susie to leave her house as soon as she can, which is usually even quicker than I. She's got great hair that can, she can wash and shake off and dry in the car to look as pretty as leaving the beauty parlor. She'll stop on the way at the Holy Land Deli to get us a foot long for our picnic lunch. The portion of the river we love the most is as picturesque and serene as one could hope for, especially so close to city life. It takes two cars for the logistics of a canoe trip, so we both drive and meet at the end of the route where she leaves her car and joins me in mine. We take my car with the canoe to the start of the route. That start might be to a public launch down a rutted gravel road called Peach Orchard. But usually Susie insists to extend the trip by starting farther upriver at a more park-like setting called Miller Island. The upper section of the river between Miller Island and Peach Orchard has more camps and a couple bridges passing over, so it is not as unspoiled, but it is still quiet and serene. And it does add half again as much to a great trip. We always take the longer route unless we start out too late in the day. It takes us only about 15 minutes to drive to Miller Island from the takeout, but it takes four hours to drift back down all the twists and turns of the river. Miller Island isn't far from the, from the dam, but it still takes about an hour for the heavier flow of the generators to reach that launch. This is perfect as the 20 minutes to get ready and the 40 minutes to get from home to the launch has us and the high water both arriving at Miller Island at about the same time. The heavier flow advances down the river like a rising wave, but, is, but it is too gradual to distinguish unless you watch the water level creep up the boat ramp. A critical part of our planning and routine 
or for any party taking such a trip, is the matter of the car keys, as most any experienced canoeist has learned the hard way. So remember this and save yourself a lot of trouble. You must always carry one key for each car down the river. One key is needed to get into the car at the end so someone can drive that car back with a second key to the beginning to fetch the other car with the roof rack we launched from. I use spare keys for this and keep them permanently in a waterproof case with my gear. This way we never forget or get confused if we're overly anxious to start our day. Beginners should have a checklist, but with my things gathered and ready, the only thing I might forget is the expendable chips and cookies. I can slide my canoe off the roof racks and the back of my SUV and lay it down on the boat ramp all by myself. In fact, I tell Susie or any would-be helper to stand clear in case I should lose it. I did once and dang near busted Susie's head. So standing clear is now clearly understood without saying. She loads all the gear in the canoe while I pull the car off the ramp up to the parking lot. <clears throat> I come back to help strap our padded folding chairs to those hard planks called seats in my 40-year-old canoe. Those planks were made for only one-hour excursions for my behind. I wire our cooler behind her in the front seat, and her front seat. The cooler has a, multiple, a multi-purpose as a backrest support for her, a table, and a cold storage chest. Her job up front is to watch for hazards and to parcel out the beverages. My job in back is to occasionally keep us pointed downriver and steer to clear paths through the fault lines. By now I know the river like the proverbial back of my hand, but I still look for the quiet fingers of water that flow between the ripples at those fault lines. The fingers indicate deeper water between the more rapid water rippling over shallow rocks on either side. Susie watches for low branches and barely submerged logs. I like threading through the low branches to test my steering skills, but Susie liked the, doesn't like the bugs and cobwebs that might occasionally hitch a ride. Sometimes we'll encounter fog with the right weather conditions. It has an interesting, eerie character. It will sit in patches or long stretches close to the water. The edges of the fog might meander, and a wave of fog may form on top and crest and break like the waves on the gentle sea, but much slower. The fog is formed where quiet, warm moist meets the cold water of the river. A whisper of breeze creates the waves and movement. Too much breeze and the fog is blown away. The fog will usually be found near the banks under shade. Out in the open where the sun shines its warmth, the fog is burnt off before it can start. We like riding through a fog. It is cool and can give us quite a chill. Even without fog, we can sometimes be drifting along and enter a patch of cool air created by that cold water. It is so refreshing on a warm day. Well-made boat launches are cleverly designed to have a pool of quiet water beyond the ramp where we can load and launch or land our canoe without fighting a current. The Miller Island ramp is exceptional for this. We easily get started and paddle into the adjacent flowing water. Our bow gets pulled downstream as we enter the flow and I don't even have to steer it that way. Susie already has our beers and their cozies and cup holders hanging in on the gunwales. I like mine on the inboard port side so I can ease access it easily with my left hand as I hold my paddle in the right. Out into the water and depending on who suggested the outing, no more than seconds go by before one of us says, what a perfect day to be on the river. Thank you, thank you. We'll sip our beers and settle back into our seats as we start another blissful day with nothing to do but enjoy the ride. Once on our way, the first thing we'll notice is the height of the water. If the river is high, the surface will meet the vegetation on the banks. You can see that at one time, it's been much higher by the clumps of brown dried leaves and grass that cling to branches sometimes eight feet up or more. It's hard to imagine the flood event that caused that. If the river is lower, we see more or less of that sticky orange-brown Tennessee dirt exposed on the riverbank. We'll always, we're, we're always curious to note the height of the water so we can anticipate the character of the trip compared to others. 
Low height means a slower trip and more turning. A higher means fast and straight. We both like the higher, but, un but it's more unusual, so it always excites us more. As we begin, the right bank of the river is the namesake for the launch, Miller Island. It is wild and thick with undergrowth and dense trees. The left bank is treed with occasional houses that are mostly modest or camp-like and never ostentatious. They blend well enough with the surroundings. A more interesting one is not a house at all, but a more perfect man cave of deck and open shelter built with rough logs and heavy ship ropes between posts for railings. It is filled with an interesting collection of items, including a meat smoker, a wood stove, split log chairs, a washboard, and a picnic table. There are a number of manly mounted deer heads and a concession to feminine touches with flower pots and ferns. I rarely see anyone there, or anywhere on the trip for that matter, but when I do, I'm going to invite myself to sit a spell and see what the river looks like from that perspective. We pass under three bridges along the way, and the first is my favorite. It carries a small country road with seldom a car. The swallows love it too, and the underside is covered with their clusters of mounds of mud houses with small round entries. Not for the birds, I approach this bridge with trepidation and keep to the left ever since we hit that submerged log right of center that once spoiled our trip royally. Perhaps my least favorite part of the trip is just after this bridge on the right. The bank is lined with houses of little thought or character, with few trees and a scattering of underinteresting collection of junk. That can happen in Tennessee. The road passes close behind these, and cars pass rather frequently and fast to create more noise and distraction than I'd like. This is what I call a concophony of sound, sight, and feelings, which I strive to avoid. Fortunately, the scenery improves quickly on the left with a thoughtfully laid out house and porch. It is set on a pleasant landscape that connects to a field and barn that are surrounded by modest wire fencing to keep in their cows. Even the right bank improves shortly with quainter cottages spread farther apart that fit the setting and are shaded by trees. After these houses, we start to leave the signs of humanity behind. One last reminder is a small Clinton City freshwater pump house on the right. They draw water from the river through a submerged pipeline that ends out near the center. There is a warning sign on the bank to obey the horn and stay clear of that section of river when it sounds. A few minutes after it sounds, they'll blow the line with air in preparation to start the pumps. That only happened once when we passed by over a span of 10 years. I was, it was exciting to watch the water boil, if you will, as the backflow of air rose to the surface. We stayed clear so we were safe. A few hundred yards after the pump house, we pass under the second bridge on the trip, which is a pair of overpasses that carry Interstate 75. The bridge towers high overhead and sits on massive columns so tall they look slender from a distance. They are sunk into the riverbed near each bank. Traffic is noisy as we approach and leave, and it reverberates as we pass under. I patiently tolerate this, knowing that just beyond, the river will take a turn and will leave the busyness behind so we can begin to enjoy the pure sights and sounds of the river and country setting that are our reason to be there. That turn takes us from drifting west to just drifting generally south. The sun faces us for a pleasant warmth in the cooler trips of the spring and fall. I don't mind the summer sun. If I get too warm, I dip my hat in the river. That cold clinch water cools my head and sends shivers through my body as it drips on my shoulders and runs down my back. The prevailing winds from the west are also now in our face to cool us a bit, but if too strong, make me work to keep us pointed down river. Susie and the picnic cooler combined are lighter than me alone, so a strong breeze wants to push her bow backwards like a weather vane as the water pulls my heavier stern downriver. Sometimes I let the wind do this, but usually I stick my paddle in the water and steer occasionally a J-stroke to keep the bow forward. It's not much effort unless the southerly breeze is strong. Strong breezes are rare in this part of Tennessee, so this is seldom a problem. Once it was strong, and I was weary of fighting it. 
I got an idea to tie the corners of our picnic blanket with one end, one end of a rope and tie the other end to the bow. I threw the blanket in the water. The strong flow of water opened the tied blanket like a parachute and pulled the canoe straight down the river. I was amazed. I thought I was clever, but when I later told a neighbor, he told me that was an old sailing trick called a wind anchor. He said it is to keep the ship pointed into or with the wind, depending on where it is tied. I called mine a water sail, which I think is more appropriate for a purpose. My water sail is not just to steer us downriver. It serves to pull us downriver against those strong headwinds. One of our fondest joys of this trip is to see the blue herons. Whether the section of river is secluded or with cottages, the blue herons can be found anywhere. I haven't figured out why we might see only a few on some trips or a dozen on other times. Blue herons seem like lonely birds, always standing alone and never with a mate. They are typically on a log low to the water, but sometimes 20 feet up, up, up above on a branch. Their color is actually areas of darker gray with a blue hue and some light gray on the belly for accent. They stand tall on the thinnest of long legs with slender bodies and long necks and much more beautiful than a fashion model of my species. They wait there quietly and barely move except maybe for their heads as they turn it to look for a fish to catch or for us to make what they might think perceived to be a threatening move. In all the years I've never seen them dive for a fish. Sometimes we can pass within 20 feet and they ignore us and stay still. I can even say, hello Mr. Heron, how's the fishing today? Other times we'll see them ahead and they'll take off with a squawk to flee us before we get close enough to see them. Occasionally we'll unknowingly get real close to one when suddenly we are all shocked out of our quiet surroundings. He by us and us by his loud squawk and flapping as he takes off to escape. When we are able to see them take off, they leap from those already high legs and seem to be flying even, be even before their wings are spread wide. They are an enormous bird in flight and as graceful flying as they are standing tall. Their flight is quiet as their wings beat slowly. As he leaves, I'll apologize. I'm sorry, Mr. Heron. We didn't mean to disturb you. In the late summer, this trip is exceptional for the many seasonal wildflowers. There are numerous patches of black-eyed Susans. I particularly like the clusters that include a mix of large bluish-gray flowers of Joe Pye and the smallest, smaller purplish uh, aster. I am excited to see the occasional red spire of cardinal flower to accent against the yellow seasons. This secluded scenic section of river passes between tree-covered mountains or open pastures of green or gold on either side. Typically along pastures, the banks are lined with trees, but occasionally there is a break to reveal an expansive view of a rolling hill with a barn or silo. I look with anticipation to see if there are cows or rolled bales of hay to decorate the hillside. Susie and I might stop and spread out a picnic blanket for lunch at the edge of one of these pastures. The grass and flowers will sometimes be a couple feet high, and we will be cozy sitting at eye level with this surrounding. We'll lay out our sandwiches and chips and sometimes glasses and a bottle of wine. After we settle in, we'll turn our heads about to look for birds and butterflies and interesting flowers. We'll look out over the river to see an occasional branches or patches of leaves moving along at the pace of a brisk walk. We rarely see another boater. Food and wine is so savory in this setting. Once we dozed off under a blanket, and somehow, perhaps by the magic of the moment, our suits came off too. We lay there snuggling and snoring in and out when we heard a motorized something or other approach. Oh no, she said. We scrambled to put on our suits, but gave up and pulled our blanket around us. A man on a four-wheeler slowed down and stopped. He was 50-ish, sunburnt, stocky, and burly, and sat on his four-wheeler, sizing up these two old folks that didn't belong there in more ways than one. I thought he might start hollering and run us off like a couple bandits caught red-handed, or in our case, red-faced. 
he took joy in making us uncomfortable with his unrestrained grin. To my surprise, he only calmly asked us to please carry out our bottle and not leave any trash. We assured him we would certainly do that anyway and would be out of there quickly. He pulled away and drove off, no doubt shaking his head. We scrambled to gather our wits and clothes and hurried back to the canoe, laughing and stumbling in bare feet and otherwise. Old folks shouldn't get caught like that. They could get hurt. That was eight or nine years ago, and in the many times we passed that spot, Susie has never failed to ask if that is where Farmer Brown, as she named him, ran us off his field. And although the name conjures up a nursery rhyme or fairy tale for us or anyone, we'll always be reminded of the birds and the bees at that place on the Clinch, Clinch River and not his cows and pigs. Speaking of cows, environmental agencies say they aren't supposed to graze down by the river and certainly not stand in it. I'd rather they didn't either for the very thought of why, but think too much and you might prefer the geese and fish to stay out too. And what gives us the authority for that? It is a treat to see the cows so close when they do come down to cool and refresh. There are usually a lot more of them that fir than first meets the eye. The others might be hidden in trees or behind bushes or behind each other. We strain to count them all. We see all colors of black, brown, white, and combinations. I think they are a pure symbol of laid back and easy going. I tease them by hollering out moo to see how many I can get to slowly turn their heads and look at us. I might get three or four sometimes. They are quite engaging and curious creatures. They stare back at me, continue, continuing their slow chew without any fear, and I suppose wondering what I want. They are my kind of people. When I first started canoeing the clinch, I had two 110-pound chocolate labs, Cassie and Chloe. They loved any adventure with me and would jump in the car with much excitement. When the car was loaded for a canoe trip, they were ecstatic because, like most labs, they loved the water. They liked it so much, in fact, they wouldn't get in the canoe. They'd rather be in it than on it, especially on a wobbly canoe. Me, Susie, our gear, and those two big labs made that canoe ride pretty low in the water. Whenever one of those blue herons took off with a squawk, or when we passed through rippling water, Cassie and Chloe would stand suddenly and both go to the same side to check out the commotion. If I wasn't prepared to throw my weight the opposite way, we were sure to tip and sink. Most of this river is no more than two to three feet deep, so this was never a tragedy. Just a cold shock and inconvenience. That might have happened a half dozen times when I finally challenged myself to do better. Being the problem solver I am, and given my country boy instincts, I jerry-rigged some outriggers like the, uh, like the Hawaiians have. I applied my New Hampshire thrift and my Tennessee simplicity. I converted my 17-foot pool po rake pole to a spar and fastened a couple VW inner tubes to the ends with copper house wire. I drilled some holes and wired the spar to the gunwales. I was amazed how well all that worked. <laughs> we never spilled again, but we did spin a few times when I got too close on one side to a bridge pier or a partly exposed fallen tree trunk. Every time we went out with that outrigger, I was sure to get a compliment for a clever creation, and especially from the Tennessee anglers who seemed to have a particular appreciation for the utility of it all. Like all good dogs, Cassie and Chloe passed on some years ago. Now I have one dog, Millie. She's a sweet lad and so friendly around the neighborhood, but oddly, she's more Terra inclined than Aqua. So she and the outrigger now stay home. I continue to take that trip probably once a week for four months of the year and a number of times beyond that. The trips follow the weather cycles. I'll wait out several days of rain and clouds or in the off months, a cold spell. If a nice day is again on the horizon, I'll check if the generators are running. When the weather and gens are in sync, I'll call Susie and in an hour we are on our way again to have another great day filled by the senses of sight 
and sound and feelings. <laughs>